Alhamdulillah Adad al-Qalqihi wa idha nafsihi wa zinat al-Arshihi wa midad kalimatihi wa muntah ilmihi wa jamia masyaa wa kalaka wa dara wa bara alim al-Ghaib wa shahadat al-Rahman al-Rahim al-Malik al-Qudus al-Aziz al-Hakim Ashadu an la ilaha illa Allahu wahtahu la sharika la lahu al-muq wa lahu al-ham yuhi wa yumit biyadi al-Khayr wa huwa hala suli shayin qadir وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم أرسله بالهدى والحق يذكره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون أما بعد أن فأن تميم الضعر رضي الله تعالى عنه قال أمر بن القتار إنه لا إسلام إلا بجماعة ولا جماعة إلا بإمارة ولا إمارة إلا بتاعة الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله we praise Allah سبحانه وتعالى we send peace and blessings upon his beloved Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and upon his family and his companions. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving us the ability and the tawfiq to adhere to his command willingly. As Allah as a wajal says in Surah Al Jumu'ah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, if nubi ala salat min yamu jumu'ah, fas au ila dhikrullahi wa dhul bayi. ذَلِكُمْ خَيْرُ لَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, when the call is made for the Jumu'ah prayer, hasten to the remembrance of Allah and leave off all business. That is better for you if you knew. This, hasten to the remembrance of Allah, that's out. إِلَى ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ these are commands from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are not suggestions. These are not recommendations. These are orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we all know, or at least we should know, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders a thing, that thing is wajib, that thing is far, that thing is obligatory. <coughs> And to respond to a command from Allah that is obligatory earns one the pleasure of Allah and the reward of Allah. To ignore it or to willfully go against it opens one up for the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ability and the means of responding to his call. The dhikr of Allah. The dhikr of Allah in this ayat is referring not only to the salah, but the khutbah, the jumu'ah khutbah as well. Wadhu leave off all business. That doesn't only mean that we stop work, that we stop whatever we're doing outside, of the masjid, that means when you come to the masjid and you're physically here, that you leave off all other business. You're not playing on your phone, you're not having conversations, you're not eating, you're not doing any of these other things, you're paying attention, you're in a, you are in a state of kushar, concentration, focus, to the khutbah as well as the salat. A lot of us forget this and we come to Juma and we talk after, after the adhan has been called or we involve ourselves in other business and it's easy for the brothers to comply and fall in line and sometimes it's harder for the sisters because a lot of times, as in the case with this masjid, 
the sisters are in a different room, they're on a different floor. So sometimes psychologically, they don't think they have, they don't have, they don't think they have to maintain the same adab as the brothers do. But they do. Because everything we do is for the reward and for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We opened up with the statement from Umar ibn al-Khattab and this statement was related to us by the other Sahabi Tamim al and you can find this statement in the collection the Sunan of uh, al where he quotes Umar ibn al-Khattab as saying La Islama illa bi He said, There is no Islam without community or without jama'at. The construction that he uses throughout this phrase is interesting because he uses the type of la or the type of negation or the type of negative construction which is called la linafil jensi means the denial of a species, the denial of the thing completely. The same type of lat is commonly used. The same type of lat is even used in our shahada. When we say there is no God except Allah, that's the same type of lat. La ilaha. You have the word la, and then after it you have the ism, you have a noun that's mansu. It ends in fatah. It's what they call the accusative, right? And so when you have that type of construction, the speaker is telling you that that thing doesn't exist. La ilaha, there is no God. If the statement was to end there, the atheist would love it because it would conform to his belief system that God doesn't exist. But in that statement, you have the istidna, you have the exception. Illallah, except Allah. Why do we mention the Shahada? Because of the construction of the lattice being used. La, next word after it, noun. How does that noun end in Arabic? Fatah. I'm driving this point home just to bring it back to the statement of Umar to show you how important it is. Right after Ayatul Kursi, there's a verse that most of us know or heard of before even though many of us apply it wrong. There's no compulsion in the religion. There's no compulsion in the deen. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayat 256. La ikraha No compulsion in religion. Listen to the Arabic. La ikraha. You have la, and then you have the word for, force or compulsion in Arabic, ikra. And how does it end? Allah doesn't say ikrahu or ikrahi. He says ikraha. La ikraha. There's no force or compulsion in the deen, in the religion. Same type of construction as the shahada. It doesn't exist. What does the statement mean? The statement means that there is no force, there is no pressure to embrace Islam. If someone, to put, if someone was to put a gun to someone's head and say, become Muslim, or get down or lay down, and that person took shahada, that Islam is not valid. That Islam was to save his life. There's no force in Islam. That's what the verse means. And I digress further to show that even this is basic Islam. I'm sure most or all of you know this already. So how is it that the disbelievers slander the Muslims and say that Islam was spread by force? You can't spread Islam by force because if you force someone into Islam, his Islam is not valid anyway. And the average Muslim knows this. Why did we mention that? Bad, now, fatah. Don't exist. A statement from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. La there's no obedience to the creation while at the same time being in disobedience to the creator. 
How was it? Lad ta'ata. No obedient. How does that word ta'ata and fata? Allah tells you to do one thing. Your leader tells you to do another thing. And you listen to your leader. That's not acceptable. So it doesn't exist. Or it's not valid. Back to the statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab. La islama illa bi jama'at. There is no Islam without community, without jama'at. And when you look at every mas'ala in the deen, you, the reality of this thing becomes crystal clear. And I know this is hard for us to accept because the time and place that we're living in forces us to radical individuality. I'm doing me. I don't care what anybody else has to say, I'm doing me. I don't care if doing me destroys everybody else, I'm doing me. It feels good, it logically makes sense to me, it appeals to my emotions, I don't care what Allah says, I don't care what the messenger says, so the law is up. I don't care what the community says, I don't care if it hurts the whole community, I'm doing me. This is the time period that we live in. Umar ibn al-Khattab said, there is no Islam without community. And there's no community, there's no jama'at without leadership. Muslims are not people of anarchy. Again, this goes against our training in this land. Because in our mind, we think that everybody's the same. Our upbringing, being born and raised here, it naturally breeds content for one another. It's just in the blood. Because we think we're all the same. The rights that are due to each and every one of us are all the same. There's no rank. There's no nothing. We're all the same. This is why you can be at work, for example, and you can outperform your co-workers and your boss or manager can recognize this and promote you and then your lazy co-worker will get upset at you because you got elevated based upon your merits. This guy, he comes, he takes a half hour break is 45 minutes for him. Punching at 9 o'clock, he shows up at 9.30. You show up early, you work hard, and he thinks he deserves what you deserve. I'm sure you, most of you experience this. That's part of the evil training in this society. That I don't have to do what you do, I don't have to be who you are, but I deserve exactly what you get. Breeds, we breed, it's breed, breeds content for each other. I don't have to study as much as the Sheikh does. I don't have to lose sleep. I don't have to leave my homeland, leave my parents, leave my family, leave my children for the sake of learning. I don't have to do any of that stuff. I have a phone. All I have to do is say, Google, Siri, tell me what the muscle is, tell me what the hookah is on this. And you think you have the exact same maqam as someone who gave his life away studying the dean because you have an Android or an iPhone and you got 4G LTE. You think you have the same right as a shape does. This is what this society breeds in us. It's a sickness that we even think like this. There is no community without leadership. And there's no leadership without obedience. What's the purpose of having a leader if you don't obey? 
And most of us, even though some of us may not say it openly, we don't even have to listen to nobody. Unless there's some adverse effect or repercussion for not obeying. If we're at work and we don't obey, we know it's only a matter of time before we lose our job, so we obey. If you're not taking away our money, you're not causing us any physical harm, we don't think we have to listen to anybody. And we have the audacity to show content, disrespect, and everything, and expect what the Sahaba expect. That's the statement of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And this is amazing that the statement came from him. Why? Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said about Umar, he said, if there were to be a prophet after him, Laukana Umar, it wouldn't be Umar. If there was a prophet after me, it would be Umar. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, every Ummah has a Muhaddath. Muhaddath, scholars go into deep detail explaining what Muhaddath is. Ibn al-Hajr al-Asqalani, the famous commentator on Sahih Bukhari, he explains, he gives very long discussion on Muhaddath. Muhaddath, I'm summarizing, is someone who the angels inspire. Or someone who Allah inspires directly. Not a prophet, not wahi ilham. In other words, why he is revelation given to prophets. Ilham is also inspiration from Allah, but it's not revelation. Allah inspires in you ideas, thoughts, opinions that are consistent with his will. And Umar ibn al-Khattab is known about this, known for this. Books have been written about this characteristic. He even spoke on it. Because there's various ayahs of Qur'an that when you read or learn the Subhubu Nuzul, the reason why those ayahs came down, it was because Allah agreed with Umar. In a hadith, I forget, he mentions about six, maybe eight or nine, I forget. In a book by Suyuti, Imam Suyuti, he mentions at least about 22 different circumstances where Umar ibn al-Khattab said something, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam something supporting what Umar said. Many occasions, taking the maqam of Ibrahim by the Kaaba as a place of prayer, about the prisoners of war. Many circumstances. Umar said something, then Allah revealed revelation in the Quran many times, almost word for word, what Umar said. So it's not a light thing that this statement is coming from Umar ibn al Khattab. So remember his statement that there is no Islam without community. And there is no community without leadership and there is no leadership without obedience Alhamdulillah 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 على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وراضي الله تعالى أن سعد تتابعين وعلماء العاملين وأئمة الأربات المجتهدين ومقلدين إلى يوم الدين أما بعد أن أنس بن مالك قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يهب لأخيه ما يهب لنفسه has been re, uh, narrated on the part of Anas ibn Malik that the Prophet Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
said, none of you believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. We're going to spend a few minutes discussing this because we're talking about community, we're talking about Jama'a, we're talking about unity, all of these things are inclusive when you're talking about Jama'a. And a lot of times we don't understand or we have vague or conflicting ideas or opinions on what Jama'a is, what community is, what unity is. So we're just going to spend a few minutes commenting on this hadith and then we'll close. Shayyuf, may that glory, may Allah develop in His mercy, has mentioned this hadith in his book, Bayan Abu Jubu Hijra Al Ibad, or the obligation of immigration on the servants, under the chapter dealing with the obliga obligation of befriending the believers. He says, Wa amal ijma'a bakat it tafaka ahl sunnati radiallahu anhum ala wujubil mawalit al mu'minina. Fi wa ala al and yes, and yes, we have the Abawahi, Al Mukminina, Wa Ali, Muwala, Al Mukminina, Wa Nasiha to Lahu, Wa La Yabu, Ahadi, Akikatan, Akikatan, Imani, Hatta, you hit by the Aki Hil Mukmin, Ma, you hit Bull the Nazi, Kadaka, Ruya, and Wasulahi, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasal. He said, As for the consensus, the Ijma, the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah, may Allah be pleased with them, are agreed upon the obligation of the believers, of befriending the believers. It's an obligation to befriend the believers. According to the Risala, this is the Risala of Ibn Abi Zayd that we've completed in this masjid, it is incumbent on the believer to seek Allah's forgiveness for his parents, if they are believers after they pass, but generally, if they are believers, I mean, if they your parents, to befriend the believers to give and to give good counsel to them. No one reaches a state of true faith until he loves for his believing brother what he loves for himself. This is the hadith as, is, as it was related from the Messenger of Allah. May Allah bless him and grant him peace. So he's commenting on this hadith. And then he continues by quoting um, Fawaka Dawani, Fawaka Duwani is a very famous commentary on the Risala, especially very famous in West Africa. The scholars use that particular commentary a lot, which is an excellent commentary on the Risala written by Sheikh Ahmed al Bunain and Nafrawi al Maliki. It says, and on Fawaka Duwani, to befriend the believers means to meet with them and show them love and avoid what creates aversion, such as rancor and hasan, Allah forbid. To befriend here does not mean mere bodily contact with them without sincere affection. And this part right here is extremely important, it's extremely relevant. It's because, again, he says, to befriend the believers means to meet with them and show them love. A lot of times we meet each other and there's no love. Or we meet each other and even though I don't say it out of my mouth, but I'm condescending. You can tell I look down on you, like, who are you? No, it's not lady. You know, we have that type of attitude with each other. And sometimes we can't always express it. We don't know find the words for it, but our spirit can tell that, you know, you think you're better than me. Right? To show the truth about this probably needs a matter of change. And avoid creating aversion. In other words, uh, brotherhood here or unity here is talking about uh, sincere affection and also avoiding what is going to cause problems. And he gave two examples: him, which is rancor or that thing that that's in the heart that prevents believers from coming together. Gilla, we spoke about this many, many times. And Hassan. And this is a man of Hassan. This is the age of envy. Envy is when you 
Or jealousy is when you want the blessing or the favor or the nitma or whatever it is that Allah has given you, you want that thing removed from your brother. For whatever reason. <coughs> that person has a wife, you want them to have a divorce. You know how you can tell you have this? Because when something bad happens to that Muslim brother of yours, you're like, ha ha! That's your, even if you don't go ha in your mind, you're like, ha, yes! That's a sign that you have hustled in you. Something bad happened to him. He lost something. He lost his job. He lost his wife. He lost his peace of mind. He's sad now, and you're happy because of that. Hostage, envy, jealousy. So befriending here does not mean mere bodily contact. In other words, and a lot of us, it's amazing that we're actually caught up on mere bodily contact. contact, uh, contact. Like we come to a gathering, and there's a thousand of us. We, oh man, yes. Alhamdulillah, we was deep in there. Yes, I just felt the love. Mm -hmm. No, you got deluded by mere bodily contact. Does not mean mere bodily contact without sincere affection. If that sincere affection is not there, you don't have unity. You don't have brotherhood. You just got a whole bunch of people in the room. Proof behind that is you could be in a bad situation. You could be in a situation where you're about to lose your house, your food, clothing, and shelter. And the brothers will leave you in that situation and go home at night and sleep comfortably knowing that you're in that situation. That's a proof that it don't exist. And then he continues. He says, it must be known as submissiveness, better known as humility to wind, to wind it, is of three divisions. One is a Humility that's obligatory. And he gives examples. Like humility shown to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To the ruler, the scholar, or towards one's father or parent. That type of humility is obligatory to people who are over you, such as the ones we've mentioned before. Again, in this society, we're not taught that. We're taught, you know, to be bold and arrogant, disrespectful, condescending, snide, you know, you know, uh, sarcastic to people. We're sarcastic to our parents. We're disrespectful to the leaders, the scholars. We just show no humility. Even though Humility to those that were mentioned is obligatory. It's wide See, it's one thing to say, none of you believe to he loves what he loves for itself. Well, you have to unpack it, and this is what we're doing now. The second category is forbidden. In other words, it's forbidden to be show humility to this category of people that we're about to mention. Like humility shown towards the people of oppression and disbelief. Because humility shown to those, to these, is a humiliation in which there is no honor and a baseness, a lowness from which one cannot be raised up. Like in the African American community, we call that cooning. Like in, a, in somebody's an oppression, oppressor. They want to hurt you, they want to cause harm to you and your community, and you think your way around that is to be humble, step and fetch, yes, yes, and all that to, to them. That's a lowness from which there's no coming up. When you look at the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, and you see how they dealt with their oppressors, and I don't have time to get, give you examples. Like Abdullah ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. How he dealt with hijab. He was an advisor to hijab, but he but he didn't wasn't like he wasn't no coon. He, he wasn't like just 
telling him whatever he wanted to hear because he was a notorious killer. He killed other Sahaba. His brothers were amongst the Sahaba. Abdullah ibn Zubair, he killed him. I killed him. In that war, the Kaaba was partly damaged. The Kaaba. One of the times the Kaaba was rebuilt was because of what happened between Abdullah ibn Zubair and Hijaj ibn Yusuf. He was killing Muslims, and not only Muslim Sahaba, and doing it boldly and publicly, hanging them for everybody to see. If you want to, if you want to get what he got, look at him. You want to, you want to do what he does, you want to get what he got. Abdullah ibn Umar wasn't scared of him. He was given cook by one time. Hajab, he was given cook by one time, and he started slandering the people. He said, "Uskut yakadab, shut up, you liar." So he wasn't no sucker. He didn't humble himself, humble himself to an oppressor. He spoke the truth to him. After the jihad, Khalid went to lock in the Sultan of Jaya. The best, one of the best jihads is to speak the truth to an oppressive ruler. <clears throat> the third category, which is men do, recommended, this is told my category to be humble to, is like the humility shown to the servants of Allah other than those mentioned above. So in other words, if this person is not Allah, if this is not Allah or his messenger or any other person who has a rank above you, just because a person is a believer, a Muslim, we should be humble towards that person. <coughs> Even if you're the leader and he's a new shahab, show him humility. And humility you know, doesn't mean biting your tongue and, and okay, I, I can't speak the truth because I'm trying to be humble. No. It's something that emanates from the heart. You can't fake being humble. People try it and people detect it. Humility. You humble because that person said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The weight of that is immense. That person could die in a better state than you. Humility. So I hope that you all have internalized what we have mentioned. We don't have time to go over and summarize, but I hope you internalize it. I hope you remember it. And more importantly, I, I hope that we act according to this.